Welcome back to the Gorak Cafe. Uh, today I'm happy to have joining us James Bradley, who is Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences here at Auburn. Before retiring, he taught cell biology and also gen ethics, that is the ethics of biotechnologies involving genes and cells and so forth in the Biological Sciences Department. Uh, before retiring, he also served as the W. Kelly Mosley Professor in Science and Humanities as the chair of the Littleton Franklin Lecture Series in Science and Humanities, and the director of the Human Director of the Human Odyssey, which is an interdisciplinary sciences and humanities course that I had the pleasure of teaching in many moons ago. So you can meet detect a science and humanities theme here. Also, back in 2007 or so, Jim and I co-designed and co-taught, along with faculty from chemical engineering and English an interdisciplinary course on the ethics of nanotechnology, which actually we got an NSF grant for, an unlikely entry on my CV. Uh, and that course we taught simultaneously face-to-face -face on the Auburn campus and as distance learning on the Auburn Montgomery campus and on the Tuskegee campus. So that was my first experience with uh, you know, distance teaching, which was a novelty then as opposed to the uh, new normal has become now. So more recently, and this is the principal occasion for this interview, uh, he's written a couple of books, uh, Brutes and Angels, uh, Human Possibility in the Age of Biotechnology from 2013, and Recreating Nature, Science, Technology, and Human Values in the 21st Century from last year, both published for, uh, by with the University of Alabama Press, but I won't hold that against him. Uh, uh, so, uh, Jim, uh, uh, can you say a little bit about these books, what motivated you to write, write them, what they're about, and uh, uh, how they differ from each other? Okay, <clears throat> well, I'll start with the first one, Roderick, the um, Roots are Angels. And the, uh, that book and, and the, the other one are both about modern biotechnologies and ethical questions that arise from these technologies either now or that I can foresee in the fairly, fairly new future. And <clears throat> so each chapter is on a, a biotechnology like stem cells or, or cloning or age retardation. Um, there's one on nanotechnology, you know, new book, uh, CRISPR gene editing. So a number of these technologies and the first half of each chapter is about the science, but it's written for non-scientists. Non and um, my wife is a, is a music person. She's a music educator and so I had her read each chapter as I was working on these books. And if she didn't understand something, which was happened many, many times, uh, then I would rewrite it and rewrite it until my musician partner could understand what I was saying. So it, so it is uh, written to be informative for, you know, even scientists that, don't read in all these different areas, but it's written to be understandable for non-science kind of people. So that's the first half of each chapter is about the science, for example, of stem cells. What is a stem cell? Uh, how, how are they used? And then the, the second portion of the chapter talks about the ethical issues that arise from this. And what I, <clears throat> I try to uh, tried real hard to do in, and I think successfully in the first book is not reveal my bias um, on these issues. My bias is should human cloning be outlawed or not? Should embryonic stem cells um, continue to be researched on? Is it okay to, to use these stem cells? And, um, but rather I, I presented uh, viewpoints from lots of different directions from different bioethicists that disagreed with each other from um, 
religious points of view, different denominations, different religious traditions. And uh, the idea was to help people become informed about the issues and then make their own choices. In the second book, <clears throat> I tried to do that with the chapters on the technologies, but it's a little different. The last two chapters, I decided it was time to reveal my bias on some of these things. And so I have a chapter on uh, responsibilities of scientists resp and some responsibilities of citizens and um, politicians, educators, science journalists, so and scientists themselves. And then the last chapter after this chapter on what I feel responsibilities of good citizens in, in the context of these technologies uh, looks like. And then the last chapter is on the urgency of doing something now in, uh, in terms of decision making about what, what we want our future as a species to look like. Um, <clears throat> so that's a little bit about what the books are, are like. There's a phrase that you use, I think it's, I think it's in the second book. Anyways, a phrase that comes up a couple of times is something like, uh, humanity is the universe's or nature's way of understanding itself and recreating itself or something like that. Uh, sort of a, a metaphor there that, um, that at least suggests the kind of openness to certain kinds of uh, transformations of nature, even if, you know, even if, you know, with the writer that it should be done with caution, uh, you know, you, yeah, you, you, know, you stress that you know, these, these changes and transformations should be done cautiously, but, you know, there's this general idea that there's something appropriate about, given the caution, embracing certain kinds of, of transformations of, of what nature has given us as opposed to simply, you know, leaving it where it stands. Yeah, I think when I when I uh, made that statement, um, I was trying to make the, the point that we are actually part of nature, and we emerge from nature. And um, <clears throat> I guess when, and I I say similar things uh, other places that have to do with evolution and our natural origins. And when I write things like that, I have in mind not only a few extended family members, but also other people I've known or know that subscribe to fundamentalist uh, scriptural views of the origin of humans and nature. And so I think it's real important to <clears throat> to teach and, and for people to learn that we are part of nature. So that anyway, that's where the, that statement, that the universe understanding itself is kind of a mind blowing thought. When you think the big bang and the origin of, of particles and eventually atoms and then galaxies and planets and that we are literally stardust, like the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young song said back in the 60s, you know, you are star, we are stardust, we are stardust. Or and as Paul Sagan used to say, we are all, there are billions and billions of stars and we are all billions. star stuff. Billions and billions. Cosmos, Cosmos show, which I watched as a kid. Yeah. And, and that this matter has, through natural processes, evolutionary processes, arranged itself into a configuration that can think about these things and participate in this interview that we're having and develop these technologies that are able to actually change um, the course of evolution if we so desired. Um, well, anyway, I, I really enjoy thinking about <clears throat> thoughts like that. And I, I like to share them with other people, whether they uh, subscribe to them or not. Um, but I don't think that was your question. I got off onto the, the Big Bang and the fact that we are literally stardust. But yes, so, so we are literally the universe contemplating itself and contemplating aspects of its future 
Um, you know, it's kind of mind blowing when you think of it that way. To me, yeah, anyway. Responsibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to say just a little bit about the title of that first book, Roots or Angels. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of people recommend against that because they said, well, you don't believe in angels, do you? And, well, no. Well, then what are you putting that in the title for? Even Pico della Mirandola, that's what you believe in, right? <laughs> yeah, so we have to read the preface in order to understand it. Um, I don't know if all of our viewers will be um, familiar with Pico, but he, uh, he here's a biologist telling a philosophical story to a, a philosopher, <laughs> but well, most philosophers I know don't know anything about Pico de la Mirandola oh, either. Really? Well, he's got to be a hero of mine. Uh, when he was just 23 years old, he, he taught himself Greek and, and Latin and Hebrew and Arabic. And his, his whole project was to try to synthesize all the wisdom and knowledge that all the different traditions that were available to him. And I think he issued a challenge to other people, like, you know, come fight me on, on all this stuff. Yeah, he did. So he, he wrote these thesis, 900 theses about everything from philosophy to natural history and anything he could think about. And then he challenged people to, uh, anybody to come and de debate him on these. And <clears throat> but he was, would have been great in the internet age. <laughs> oh, he would have been. That would have been, that would have worked out better for him because his mistake was he, in his invitation, he said that this was going to take place in Rome. He was writing in Florence, but he said, well, go to Rome for this and the Pope will be the arbiter and we'll decide who, who wins the debate. But he hadn't <clears throat> run this by the Pope first. He just announced it. And so the Pope got wind of this and had uh, some of his uh, surrogates look over the 900 theses and they decided that uh, a dozen or so of them were heretical. And so the Pope sent out an arrest warrant for Pico. He said, I'm not gonna participate in this and I want this guy in, in chains. And so Pico ran away to France. But <clears throat> anyway, the title, um, he, he he wrote this little essay called The Oration on the Dignity of Man that was to be the introduction for this big debate. And in there, and he's speaking to Christians. And so he, he sets this essay in the Garden of Eden and he has God talking to Adam, Adam <clears throat> telling Adam how special he is. He says, I've, you know, I've made the birds with wings that, so they can fly and fish can swim and and to you, I've given no real special um, talent like this, but I've given you your reason. And with your reason, you can make out of yourself whatever you desire. You can be like the brutes in the field, or you can become divine like the angels. It's your choice. And so <clears throat> I, I like that. Um, it was a choice making that uh, Pico was talking about. And he, you know, being a Renaissance uh, person, that, that was, uh, that, that, you know, pulling themselves out of the dark ages and realizing that humans can <clears throat> be their own navigators through life. And, and so I like that. And that we literally now we've reached a, a place in the 21st century where we literally can make of ourselves whatever we wish. Um, whether it be with nanotechnology or genetic technologies. And um, so it's back to the choice making. <laughs> That's where the title came from. I, I hope uh, not too many people pass uh, the book by because of the title. But anyway, I like the title. <laughs> Yeah, and then the, the title of the second one, Recreating Nature, I guess that doesn't require as much explanation, but uh, in a way, it's sort of on the same theme that we've been handed this nature. I mean, because one of the things people says is that human beings don't, I mean, in a way, it almost anticipates SARS. Humans don't have a fixed nature the way that the animals do. We can sort of choose what nature we're going to have. Um, 
and uh, you know, so recreating nature sort of picks up that that theme. Yeah, and the creating, the recreating implies that it had been created, and of course, I'm, I mean through natural selection. Mm -hmm. And actually, early in, the, in that book, um, I think I list a dozen things that I believe every schoolgirl and schoolboy should be taught. And the um, evolutionary origin and history of the biosphere, including ourselves, is one of those things. Uh, and, and then also the interconnectedness of life, that ecology, uh, the fact that we are part of this complex web, which even the ecologists today with all their mathematical modeling don't com completely or sometimes even barely understand. So here we've developed methods, uh, something called CRISPR, which is a gene editing tool where you can change the genetic composition of virtually any species on earth or decide to make a species extinct if you wanted to do that or maybe bring back an extinct species. And <clears throat> so with this ability to do these things, I think that the decision makers, which are all of us also need to have a sense of what natural selection has taken three and 3.8 billion years to produce and how tweaking it a little bit. And I'm not a Luddite when it comes to these things. I think there are, there are places for, for doing some, some of this tweaking, but not by maybe people working in a, a, a Manhattan apartment laboratory that they, they set up and decide, well, let's see, what can we create today and let loose? And not that that's happening this minute, but it could, could be happening 10 or 15 years from now with, with some of these technologies that are really very easy to use. I found to my surprise that that even a number of scientists that I've talked to who are not in biology but in other fields often have only the vaguest conception of, of what natural selection is. And I'm certainly no expert, but I found that I was explaining it to them. Uh, I thought, this is weird. Why am I explaining natural <laughs> selection, which I'm no expert on, to a scientist? Uh, but um, scientists in other fields often, often you know, have sort of have a kind of narrow compartmentalized vision and they, you know, they may be experts on I think physics or chemistry or something, but they, you know, they, they, you know, they don't understand exactly what natural selection is and, and how it works. No. I think that's a reflection of the terrible job that this country does in you know, teaching mm -hmm. biology and evolution through K through 12. And maybe even well, it, it, certainly K through 12. I remember growing up, my impression of how evolution worked was that uh, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, the, as almost, it was sort of Lamarckian. I mean, the, um, uh, the giraffe stretches its neck in order to reach the, you know, the higher leaves on the trees. And as a result, it ends up with a stretched neck, which it then passes on to, the, to its, uh, its offspring. I remember in high school, I took a biology class where they showed a film that explained natural selection for the first time. And when I heard it, I thought, oh my God, this makes perfect sense. This, this is just a brilliant uh, idea. And of course, you know, if, you know, if, uh, you know, if there's random variation among uh, uh, creatures and if some of these variations are more, uh, uh, you know, likely to lead to survival and reproduction than others. And of course that will lead to their, you know, uh, those, um, those advantages proliferating the next generation and so on. Um, and, you know, once I saw what natural selection was, I thought, well, this is, you know, this is such a cool idea. How could anyone, you know, coherently deny it? But some do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. <clears throat> it's a problem. In, this country. And in a way, you can see artificial selection as a form of natural selection, in that you know, since we're, you know, where we are part of, you know, if you are, 
you know, if you're breeding dogs, let's say, you are part of their environment. It's just that, you know, you're a, a deliberate and conscious part of the environment rather than a random thing. But, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if you are trying to breed dogs with longer ears, say, then, then you constitute an environment that's more favorable to, you know, to longer ears. And so, you know, you're, in a sense, uh, just a special case of, of natural selection, which would put, fit in with your theme that these things we do to change, you know, which obviously, you know, the things you're talking about in these books go way beyond the kind of breeding that, of animals that, and, and plants that, that uh, human beings have been, have been doing for millennia. Uh, but they are, you know, they're just ways in which, uh, you know, we affect the environment of things and we can affect the environment of ourselves. But of course we can make choices about those things in the way that, uh, you know, when the, you know, if the climate gets warmer or colder and that sort of affects the course of evolution, that's not, that's not the climate making a choice that wants more creatures like this and fewer ones like that, but uh, we have one. Yeah, one, one thing on, on that subject that disturbs me is there have been a few um, biologists actually, but I would say biologists that aren't very well-versed in ecology, kind of what we would call gene jocks, uh, people that are good at manipulating genes but don't have a sense of the broader picture of the biosphere. Anyway, a few, a few people have suggested that, well, we have these problems, uh, the human-made problems to the environment now, like global warming and, and uh, the pollution and high salinity in places where there shouldn't be and, and we're changing all these habitats. So now that we can re-engineer plants and animals, why don't we just create new ecosystems that can thrive in the mess that we've created? And that this is a wonderful solution. <laughs> and, and so that's, you know, that kind of scares me because there are two problems with that. One is it encourages you to just forget about uh, trying to pollute less or um, do something about climate change. And then the other thing is it has this arrogance of assuming you can just create an ecosystem or change an existing one and it's going to work just fine. Yeah, it's kind of the equivalent of Soviet central planning only for the environment, thinking, okay, well, here's this complex, uh, you know, self-regulating system that's gradually evolved over time, and we can just come in so we can just reorder it. We can, uh, you know, we can design it all from scratch, and you know, yeah. it seems like, you know, we're very far away from confidence of being able to do anything like that, yeah. of not knowing enough about exactly what you know what things are you know, what things are playing what kinds of crucial roles in the system <clears throat> these um in the second book i call these trans these uh technologies uh transformative and someone might say well hasn't every technology been transformative on you know in some way or another I mean, these things that we're wearing, certainly, I would hate to have lived before they were widely available. It would have really have exactly. screwed up my life. Um, but transformative in the sense of, of changing our relationship to nature and then changing maybe even human nature itself, whatever that, whatever you might say that human nature is. Um, Right, and, and changing our relationships to each other. So just one interesting example to think about is uh, age retardation. This is, the, this is a technology of slowing down the aging process, maybe even halting it eventually, so that humans would live easily for centuries, maybe millennia. And there are a few, we had a little Ken Franklin lecture a number of years ago Ray Kurzweil, who is my age, and I'm over 70 now, and he, when he visited Auburn, he told me he actually believes that he's going to be the, the first uh, immortal human being because of 
technologies. And so therefore he always wears a seat belt and takes vitamins because he doesn't want to die from some stupid accident or malnutrition um, before these come online. But anyway, back to what I was going to say with age retardation, imagine um, a portion of the world's population taking the pill or, or doing the genetic change or whatever it is that's necessary to greatly retard the aging process. And say you do this when you're 16 or 18 years old and a couple of years later you <clears throat> fall in love with somebody and get married and have children but your your spouse isn't uh, isn't engineered this way to, for age retardation so after another 10 years you know your spouse is 30 and you're still behaving like a 19 year old or looking like one and and you're on through the, the decades and you can just imagine all sorts of scenarios in society. You know, I mean, you know science fiction the stories have been written precisely, you know, examining yeah. kinds of scenarios. Yeah, and so this going all the way back to the 18th century with William Godwin, uh, uh, who wrote a novel called uh, Saint Leon about a um, a guy who discovers both the secret of eternal youth and the secret of making turning lead into gold, and then he explores sort of the actual practical consequences of of what that would be like and uh and you know how you deal with your personal relationships and your social relationships and your legal relationships and, and uh so on and it it turns out uh you know not to be quite as delightful as uh <laughs> as he had hoped <laughs> yeah well they these these do sound like like science fiction. I've got to look that one up. I'd like to read that that one you just, novel you just told about. But he achieves, uh, you know, he achieves this uh, you know, this eternal youth through alchemy. So it's not exactly uh, you know, cutting edge science from a point of view. But then you know, here I am with a mug that has the basic elements on it: oh. <laughs> earth, water, air, fire, and ether. It's the period. It's the periodic table of elements. I don't, I'm not really up to date. I don't know if anything has been added since Aristotle's time, but this is what I've got. <laughs> and now this mug is empty, but I've got another one. Came prepared. Oh, that's a real cost. That's the, the motto of my, uh, of my video on it. This oh, on it. Okay. Anyway. That's a complete digression. Um, anyway, you were, you were saying so that you have, you know you've got a problem if someone's been engineered to have uh, you know to have age retardation and then they have social relationships with other people who have not been so engineered, and so that's what you were saying when I started interrupting you with. Yeah, well, I, w I was finished with that, and it, it's I mean just then you, everybody can use their own imagination to envision the, the various problems. Some of them That's what happens if there's, a, if there's like an elite that has access to this technology and ordinary people don't. And so you get a, you know, sort of elite of, um, uh, of uh, you know, sort of immortals who are living on and on forever or, or semi-immortal. I mean, you know, they're not really immortal because you know, they could all be hit by a bus or something, but uh, mm -hmm. semi-immortals living on and on forever and ordinary people aren't. Uh, that could create a, a nasty power imbalance. And of course, if ordinary people turn against them, they could be, turn into a nasty power imbalance in the other direction. But in either case, it, it could be problematic. Yes, that further social stratification of society actually is an issue with all of every one of these technologies. The problem of um, what philosophers say, distributive justice. Well, who gets the benefit? And that's maybe one of the easier, it's not easy to solve, but that, that's a, not a new ethical question. And, and all of these have their own kind of new ethical issues as, as well. But distributive justice, I think, is a, is a real big one that goes across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so of course some people are going to have the 
you know, have the response of just, you know, sort of, you know so I mean, since you're, you're trying to steer between, you know, two extremes, because on the one hand, there are people who say, oh, what does it matter? You know, just, you know, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to pursue this however I want, and I don't care what the distributive effects are, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, the people, sort of the, the hyper-cautious people say, this is a reason not to engage in any of this stuff, you know, just leave nature untouched as we found it. Um, you know, so there are people who are sort of, you know, there are the people who are sort of, um, uh, you know, hyper ambitious and, you know, not worried about you know, consequences or not humble about their ability to manage these things versus people who take kind of an ultra cautious uh, attitude that you should just accept the, uh, you know, the nature that God has given us. And so you know, I see these books as sort of you're trying to steer a path between those two extremes. Yeah, I'm particularly in the in the second book, in the, the last chapter, I talk about, and maybe it's pie in the sky wish, but I talk about the importance of a global decision-making process. To think about long-term goals for the species and these would have to be general because we can't really imagine. Well, people 200 years ago couldn't imagine things, the specific things that we're living with now. And, and so, of course, it's the same for us. But we could talk about goals like do we want different forms of humans, some may be specialized for space travel and some specialize for interfacing their minds with computers. And, and, and so do we want to go down that path toward <clears throat> different, we call them races of um, but different types of humans who specialize for different things. So do we want to go down this path of trying to engineer ecosystems that I mentioned earlier? And um, and so some of these paths, once you start down them, I think are irrevocable. And you can't just turn around and, and decide, well, I didn't mean to take that fork in the, in the road. I'm going to go back and take the other way. And, and that's not going to be possible with many of these once we start down the, the road. So in the context of this global decision-making process, I want to mention that there's a person named Gerald Feinberg, who was a physicist, I think at Columbia in the 60s and 70s. And he wrote a book, a little book called The Prometheus Project. And I picked up a paperback <coughs> copy of this when I was a graduate student in some used bookstore. And I carried it around with me all these years. And I'd never read it. Well, when I was writing this second book, The Recreating Nature, I, I found it on my shelf and I read it. It's just a short little book. And he, I think in 1969, he published this and, and he was at that point as a physicist concerned about the ethical implications of computer, the future of computer science, uh, genetic technologies and information technology. And um, and so the Prometheus project was this 25 to 50 year long project he envisioned. And this, remember this is before um, social media and email and everything, where there would be a global democratic process of deciding on long range goals. And he had a, really he had it pretty well planned out in, in the vetting process and, and how the committee would be selected that that would vet all of these uh, ideas that would come in and, and then they, they'd have to go out again. And he thought that, like I said, the whole process might take 50 years. Well, here it is more than 50 years since he wrote that book and nobody's even talking about this, or let alone initiating anything. And here now we have the technologies that can lead us down these irrevocable paths that he talked about. And, um, given the realities of politics, there's always the worry, suppose we had this global decision-making process 
you know, who's actually going to be making the decisions. Because on the one hand, if it's, you know, if it's, uh, you know, really democratic, you might get lots and lots of input from people who don't even believe in evolution. On the other hand, if it's not democratic, if it's some kind of educated elite that is being appointed by someone, and who's appointing them? Donald Trump. I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, you know so there's, there's sort of the, you know, just as there's the worry about how to design the, you know, the ecosystem is also the way about how to design a, a political ecosystem uh, in the same way. So it's, it's, you know, it was interesting. One thing that I've often puzzled over is that, um, uh, you know, in sort of disputes about the left and right is that, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, people who are very confident about their ability to design, redesign social systems, but I think you have to leave the ecosystem alone. And other people who are very confident about their ability to redesign ecosystems, we have to leave the social system alone. Um, and they seem to present similar problems. Um, and yet it seems often that in order to leave one of them alone, you have to do something with the other. Um, yeah, anyway, so it's just a, just That's a recurring a problem. Interaction that I hadn't thought of between biological and political ecosystems. <laughs> we should follow up on that rather. Yeah, I remember that was an idea that I had back back when I was teaching at Chapel Hill. I was part of a reading group on, I guess, broadly speaking, environmental ethics, and you know that was uh, you know I worry that you know, if you if you try to that I thought about you know, if if you try to um, if you try to interfere with, uh, you know, with what people are, are doing with these technologies, you are trying to micromanage a, uh, a social economic system that's, that's very difficult to do. But if you don't, then you, you know, they're allow you're allowing them to try and micromanage an, uh, a natural ecosystem that's very hard to do. Um, you know, though I think that uh, you know, tackling things from the, from the distributive justice end you know, might be helpful for that if you think of the distributive justice and not so much as sort of micromanaging who gets what, but as trying to remove some of the factors that, you know, that privilege certain powerful and wealthy groups uh, against others. But you know, it doesn't mean that's a panacea, um, which isn't an area where there are any panaceas. Yeah, I'll be thinking about this now for a long time. <laughs> so, now, um, go ahead. What, what else would you like to? Well, I was going to say, after writing the first book uh, on uh, uh, brutes or angels, what motivated you to to write the second one? Because um, there's some overlap, although they're not. There's also you know, some significant difference. But um, what made you think? Yeah, well, five or six um, years later, oh, I need to revisit these questions. A part of it was very, very practical. There are chapters in the second book, uh, as you just alluded to, that aren't in the first book. So like a nanotechnology, because the CRISPR technology wasn't uh, around yet when I published the first one. And um, well, there's <laughs> genetically engineered uh, agriculture um, was not in the first book. Mm -hmm. uh, robots and then roboethics, that's, that's a new topic. And, and then the human, um, the brain research project that Obama initiated and a similar project that the European Union initiated, those were all new. So, <clears throat> So there are new topics. And so anyway, for the practical uh, aspect of it was when I submitted the first book, I had chapters in there on nanotechnology and on a couple of these other topics in the second book. And, and the University of Alabama press person immediately wrote back and said, you either have to cut each every chapter in the book in half, or you're gonna have to leave out for these chapters because it's going to be too long and nobody's going to want to pick up a book that's 450 pages long and some of us might but <laughs> so, so i left the chapters out <laughs> <I read them> both. 
And so that's part of, the, part of the reason for the second book was to cover these other topics. But then also um, the main reason was um, you know, that I'd read this book by Feinberg that I just mentioned. And I got to thinking about the importance of educating um, as many people as possible about these and getting them to think about decisions, making decisions. And, and so I, I just felt compelled to, to do this second one and, and include the material in there about the urgency of actually thinking about these things. Now when the pandemic is over, maybe people can th begin thinking about something else if that ever happens. It never will be over. <laughs> Probably not. <clears throat> the, the, um, if you had asked me why did I write the first one, I, I had an interesting story, which I won't make real long. But I was about oh, four years from retirement, and I had spent about 35 years working on cricket ovaries. And I thought, um, oh, and I had just bought a book by a, a biologist at Harvard named Ernst Meyer, and he was 95 years old at the time, and he had yeah, you mentioned that in the introduction. Yeah, yeah. and so he, he, were, he kind of, he liked to write about philosophy and philosophy of biology, and he challenged in a new book he published just before I started on the first book called What is Biology? And in the beginning of it, he challenged all biologists and scientists in general to take time out from their, their work and their research at, at some point in their careers and write about the philosophy of science in the context of what they do and the relevance of their work for society at large. And he, he said, every scientist should do this at some point. Well, I was having a beer at the Amsterdam Cafe at the time and, and I was four or five years from retirement and he kind of, I thought, well, I can work real hard for four years and maybe publish five or six papers on crickets that about six or seven people in the world would be really interested in reading. Or I could just forget about the crickets and start on something to respond to this challenge of Ernst Meyer. And, and so I talked to my department head and he was supportive, which uh, I'm very grateful for. And so I started working on the roots or angels and stopped working on the crickets. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, you've had the sciences and humanities interdisciplinary interest for a long time, as I mentioned in, in introducing you uh, back with the human odyssey yeah. course and the lecture series and the nanoethics course and uh, and all these things. And so it's not it's not as though you had been completely ignoring you know this dimension. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in, until until you admire, right? Talk about transformative. The Human Odyssey was transformative for me when I was first taught in it, and, and then remained involved. <clears throat> it opened my mind to so many different things that I I wouldn't have. And I really enjoyed teaching in that course. That was a lot of fun. Well, I'm I'm glad and. I was really grateful that you were in it. You contributed a lot. And also with the nanotechnology, that was fun too. I don't know if the students thought it was as much fun as we thought it was. But. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and of course, we had a lot of problems with not so nanotechnology, <laughs> trying yeah. to connect to the various campuses. Uh, yeah. Probably that would go smoother nowadays, um, so. uh, that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, that was fun. Um, well, Roderick, I'm going to come to your cafe and, and check it out. I, I listened to some of your presentations, and I don't know if you have other interviews or, or what all you have on it. But I'm, I've got you. Know, I've got more interviews uh, uh, coming up. Um, uh, you know, some of them are you know are with me, you know, sort of my my libertarian and anarchist. Uh, uh, pals, but not all of them. One of the one of the ones I just did was with my own 
colleague here at Auburn, Kelly Jolly in philosophy. Um, so that, that's one that may that some of my viewers may find dismaying because it has no political content whatsoever. <laughs> uh, but to them, I'm just going to say, well, gosh, there's more to life than politics. Come on. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed doing that interview. Um, and uh, you know, just you know, my brief when I uh, when I started this channel was was both um, uh, you know just sound off. Sorry about this. You'd think there'd be a way to silence this phone or unplug it, but there isn't. It's a long story. Um, uh, the uh, uh, as my brief was just to sound off on whatever I wanted to sound off on, and also to interview various interesting people. I didn't have any particular uh, you know preconceived notion about you. Know, about them all having to be, uh, you know, political or they're all having to be philosophers or anything like that. Just, you know, whoever was, uh, uh, was um, uh, someone I thought would be interesting to talk to. And then I, you know, I read these two books of yours and I thought, well, this, this is uh, definitely something interesting. And I'm going to put links in the description of this video to uh, you know, to your books so that people can buy them and read them because they should because these are very interesting books. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on your on your channel. Uh, and thanks for coming on. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Well, no, just um, encourage everybody to self-educate on these topics and try to think beyond the current obsession with viruses. I guess, do you have any thoughts on the, you know, on the coronavirus situation since, since it is sort of a biological issue in some sense? Any thoughts on how it should be handled as opposed to how it's actually being handled? If we took three weeks right now and shut everything down and kids were staying at home instead of going to school and same with university all over then we come back after three weeks and things would be as Trump likes to say under control I mean it would never be completely gone but and if we had done that four months ago just three weeks across the board everybody doing the right thing but, and, and you see in, in, in China and a number of other places in Europe that had tremendous outbreaks, they're practically back to normal now because they did the right thing. And in here, for all sorts of different reasons, but mainly, <laughs> in my opinion, because Trump wanted to be reelected and figured the only way he was going to be reelected is if the stock market was really good. And he, and he figured if I just ignore, if I, if I say it often enough, the virus is going to hear me and it's going to go away. And it was going to be going away in April and it was to be gone away by Mother's Day when everybody was going to be back in church and it was going to be gone away by Labor Day. And, but anyway, as a biologist, just haven't done the logical thing. You need to listen to Dr. Fauci. <laughs> that's my that's my comment on this. Very frustrating. We got football going to start at Auburn on September 26th. Oh man, the whole stadium packed. That's that's just great. Even with it not packed. I mean, how can the players face each other in the line? It's hard to to physically distance yourself from someone you're tackling. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's frustrating because there are, are very simple, logical things to do, and we just haven't done them. Um, Governor Cuomo, in his little island of influence, did very well. Right there. Um, we ought to elect him. <clears throat> as the it's philosopher king for a while. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, Roderick, for the interview. It's been fun. Sure, thanks. All right, so farewell.
Okay, you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.